Hello and welcome back. Today we're overclocking the Intel Core i7-14700K all the way up to 6.2 GHz using the Asus ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero motherboard and EK Quantum Custom Loop water cooling. This is the second 14 generation CPU that I'm overclocking on this channel after the 14900K from a couple of weeks ago. And I think the 14700K is probably the most interesting C CPU from that entire Raptor Lake refresh lineup. Anyway, let's get started. The Intel Core i7-14700K is the middle processor of Intel's 14th generation Core Case-Q lineup. The Raptor Lake refresh processors launched one year after the launch of the original Raptor Lake processor. The Raptor Lake refresh processors are identical to Raptor Lake, bar specifics such as frequency, core count, and L3 cache of specific SKUs. For example, the Core i7-14700K features four additional e-cores and seven megabyte additional L2 and L3 cache compared to its 13th generation direct predecessor. It also has a 200 megahertz increase in maximum turbo boost frequency while maintaining the same base frequencies. Intel Raptor Lake Refresh builds on the same performance hybrid architecture introduced with the 12th generation Alder Lake. Like the 13th generation Raptor Lake CPU, it is built using an improved process dubbed Intel 7 Ultra. In this video, we're covering five different overclocking strategies. However, before we jump into the overclocking, let's first have a look at the hardware and the benchmarks that we'll be using in this guide. The system we're overclocking today consists of the following hardware. The Elmo Labs EZ Fan Controller is the older brother of the EFCSB or the EZ Fan Controller Scatterbencher Edition, which I've used many times on this channel. I've attached an external temperature sensor from the water in the loop to the EFC. Then I use the low high setting to map the fan curve from 25 to 40 degrees water temperature. We use Windows 11 and the following benchmark applications to measure performance and ensure system stability. Before we start overclocking, we must check the performance at stock settings. The default Turbo Boost 2.0 parameters for the Core i7-14700K are as follows. Please note that the Z790 Dark Hero motherboard unlocks the power limits out of the box. So in order to check the performance of this 14700K at stock settings, we first have to go into the BIOS and go to the Extreme Tweaker menu, set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Disabled Enforce All Limits, enter the Internal CPU Power Management submenu, set CPU Cache Current Limit Max to 307 amps. Here's the benchmark performance at stock. When running the old CCT CPU AVX2 stability test, the average CPU P-Core effective clock is 5,146 MHz, and the average CPU E-Core clock is 3,996 MHz with 1.108 volts. When running the old CCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU P-Core effective clock is 5,292 MHz, and the average CPU E-Core clock is 4,070 MHz with 1.164 volts. Now let's go to our first overclocking strategy. But before we start overclocking, make sure to locate the clear CMOS button. Pressing the clear CMOS button will reset all your BIOS settings to default, which is helpful if you want to start your BIOS configuration from scratch. However, it does not delete any of the BIOS profiles previously saved. In our first overclocking strategy, we take advantage of unlocking the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits and enabling Intel XMP 3.0. Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 technology is an Intel technology that lets you squeeze more performance out of your CPU when it's running below its rated temperature, frequency, voltage, and current operation. Essentially, it pushes the CPU to higher frequencies when the headroom is available. The Turbo Boost algorithm works according to a proprietary EWMA formula. This stands for exponentially weighed moving average. There are three parameters to consider, PL1, PL2, and Tau. Similar to Alder Lake, PL1 is by default equal to PL2 for the case q CPUs. This change effectively means that Intel has enabled near unlimited peak turbo by default. The maximum performance is therefore entirely limited by the capabilities of your cooling solution. If your cooling solution is insufficient, the processor will reduce the operating frequency at the maximum allowed temperature or TJ max. 
for Raptor Lake refresh CPUs that's at 100 degrees Celsius. An easy ASUS multi-core enhancement option on ASUS motherboards allows you to unleash the Turbo Boost power limits. Adjusting the power limits is, strictly speaking, not considered overclocking, and that's because we don't change any of the processor's frequency, electrical, or thermal parameters. Intel provides the Turbo Boost limit guidance to motherboard makers or system integrators to ensure that those boards or those, those systems can run the processor at the base configuration. However, as we all know, motherboards with better power delivery or systems with better cooling can sustain higher turbo boost and higher performance for a longer period of time. Intel Extreme Memory Profile, or XMP, is an Intel technology that lets you automatically overclock the system memory to improve system performance. It extends the standard JDEX specification and allows a memory vendor to program different settings onto the memory sticks. Intel Extreme Memory Profile 3.0 is the new XMP standard for DDR5 memory. It is primarily based on the XMP 2.0 standard for DDR4, but it has additional functionality. There's a lot more to the new XMP 3.0 standard, which is outside of the scope of this overclocking guide. Check out my Alder Lake launch video if you want to have more details about XMP 3.0. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits, and save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. As expected, since we're not increasing the frequency of the CPU cores, the performance improvement is relatively limited. That said, improving the memory performance by using XMP 3.0 and providing more headroom for power consumption helps improve performance in specific workloads. We see the highest performance improvement of plus 11.84% in AI benchmark. When running the OCCT CPU AVX2 stability test, the average CPU P-Core effective clock is 5,260 MHz, and the average CPU E-Core clock is 4,136 MHz with 1.16 volts. When running the OCCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU P-Core effective clock is 5,408 MHz, and the average CPU E-Core clock is 3,830 MHz with 1.2 volts. In our second overclocking strategy, we leverage the Intel Speed Optimizer technology embedded in the Foundation Toolkit. Foundation Toolkit is a CPU silicon customization software co-developed by Benchmade and Scatterbencher. While we have big hopes and dreams for the application, the Foundation Toolkit is currently only integrating the Intel Extreme Tuning utility. The Foundation Toolkit enables precise CPU performance tuning and caters to Intel KSQ CPU users. Currently, the application is publicly available for anyone to try. However, please be aware that the Foundation software presently offers limited functionality. The toolkit consists of four primary tools. We use the Intel Speed Optimizer function in this OC strategy. Intel Speed Optimizer, or ISO, is a performance-enhancing technology embedded in the Intel Extreme Tuning Utility software. Its primary purpose is to simplify overclocking. If your processor supports ISO, you can enable higher performance by clicking a single button. ISO should stay enabled even after rebooting the system. Note that you cannot do any manual tuning after enabling ISO. If you want to manually tune your CPU, you must disable ISO. After enabling ISO, the following settings have changed. As you can see, ISO relies primarily on enabling higher power limits and slightly boosting the CPU core frequency to improve performance. The OCTVB configuration ensures default CPU performance above 90 degrees Celsius. First, go into the BIOS and go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2, then save and exit the BIOS and reboot the system. Upon entering the operating system, go to the Foundation Toolkit website. Make sure to install and start the software. Browse to the ISO tab, then click Enable Optimizer. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. The extra bump in frequency helps add a little more performance in both light single-threaded workloads and heavy all-core workloads. We see the highest performance improvement of plus 15.66% in AI benchmark. When running the OCCT CPU AVX2 stability test, 
The average CPU P-Core effective clock is 5173 MHz, and the average CPU E-Core clock is 4058 MHz with 1.144 volts. When running the OCCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU P-Core effective clock is 5,352 MHz, and the average CPU E-Core clock is 4,122 MHz with 1.201 volts. In our third overclocking strategy, we rely on the Asus AI overclocking technology to squeeze more performance out of our CPU. For many years, motherboard vendors have tried to provide enthusiasts with an easy way to automatically squeeze more performance out of their CPU. Usually that is by providing OC profiles. But in the past, these OC profiles were either too ambitious in terms of the frequency targets or too generous with the voltage provided. So you didn't always end up with a stable or uh, not overheating system. Asus AI overclocking technology is slightly different. Instead of working with a preset frequency and voltage profile, the system will monitor the CPU and cooling system throughout an initial testing phase. Based on its findings, it will then predict the optimal settings. The system automatically guides the overclocking process and adjusts the voltages and frequency to match your cooling system. The better your cooling, the higher your AI overclock. There are three steps to enabling AI overclocking. First, reset the BIOS to default settings, then reboot and enter the operating system. Run a couple of heavy workloads, such as Cinebench R23 or OCCT stress test for 10 to 30 minutes. Then return to the BIOS and enter the AI OC guide menu from the top. Make sure to read through the explanation and click enable AI when ready. In addition to automatic overclocking, AI overclocking provides a lot of advanced information and suggestions in the AI features menu. The SP value is based on the combination of maximum boost frequency, temperature and P0 VID. The overclocking suggestions are based on a continued evaluation of your CPU thermal solution. There are a couple of additional features to fine tune the AI overclock configuration. For example, optimized AVX frequency allows you to toggle between normal use and heavy use, where heavy use would be selected if you're running extreme workloads like OCCT AVX2 enabled. After enabling AI overclock, the following settings have changed. The ASUS Package Temperature Threshold is yet another ASUS feature that helps you manage your system configuration. Unlike TJ Maxx, TCC Offset or Fast Throttle, in this case it's the motherboard itself that tries to regulate the temperature of your CPU. In short, the ASUS motherboard will track the CPU operating temperature during operation. The CPU will be reduced once the temperature exceeds your target temperature. It does this not directly by adjusting the CPU ratio, however. Instead, it uses the Turbo Boost power limit parameters. By lowering the power limits, the Intel CPU will adjust the CPU ratio down on its own. A caveat to this technique is that the motherboard doesn't know which power limit to target to stay below the target temperature, so it needs a more extended period to determine the proper power limit. Additionally, the motherboard is slower to react to changes in CPU temperature than the CPU itself. On the system, AI Overclock sets the package temperature threshold to 95 degrees Celsius. Upon entering the BIOS, enter the AI Overclocking Guide. Go through the guide, then click Enable AI. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. With AI overclocking, we increase the processor frequency quite a bit over the stock settings from 5.6 GHz to 6.1 GHz for the P-Cores. Therefore, we expect a slight performance uplift, which we see in the benchmark results. The performance uplift from AI overclocking is surprisingly good. We have the best performance improvement of plus 17.30% in Geekbench 6. When running the OCCT CPU AVX2 stability test, the average CPU P-Core effective clock is 5,136 MHz and the average CPU E-Core clock is 3,970 MHz with 1.113 volts. When running the OCCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU P-Core effective clock is 5,285 MHz and the average CPU E-Core clock is 4,041 MHz with 1.169 volts.
In the fourth overclocking strategy, I'm pursuing a simple manual overclock with two main objectives. One, we're gonna try to increase the frequency where possible, and two, we'll make minor adjustments to the voltage where necessary to ensure stability. But for the most part, I'll be relying on the motherboard auto rules to do the voltage configuration. We'll dig a little bit deeper in the voltage configuration of a 14700K in the fifth and final overclocking strategy. I use the OCCT CPU test in various configurations to check the stability test for each P core and E core. My preferred test is 30 seconds with two threads enabled per core when testing the stability of each core. Then, of course, I use the all core stability test for verifying stability in a worst case scenario. Generally speaking, there are two ways to configure the CPU ratio on an Intel CPU sync all cores or by core usage. Sync all cores sets a single fixed ratio applied to all cores. This is very much the historical way of Intel CPU overclocking. Turbo ratio configuration allows us to modify the default Intel frequency specification and configure an overclock for various scenarios. Before we go any further, there are three important aspects to understand of turbo ratio configuration. One, you can configure the maximum allowed CPU ratio for any number of active cores. Two, you can configure the maximum allowed CPU core ratio for a given CPU core. And three, the turbo ratio configuration for the P core and the E cores are independent. To explain the first point, let's take the default configuration of the 14700K. The 14700K has a total of eight P cores. Therefore, we can configure the maximum allowed P core ratio for when one P core is active, when two P cores are active, all the way up to when eight P cores are active. The standard configuration allows every P core to boost to 5.5 GHz when all cores are active. In our overclock, we adjust the turbo ratio configuration to boost to 6 GHz when up to 4 P cores are active, to 5.8 GHz when up to 6 P cores are active, and to 5.7 GHz when up to 8 P cores are active. To explain the second point, let's consider the 14700K default specification again. While the 14700K has eight identical P cores, two of those cores are called the favored cores. The maximum allowed frequency for the favored cores is 5.6 GHz, whereas the others are limited to 5.5 GHz. In this strategy, we let all cores boost to the maximum of 6 GHz. To explain the third point, again, let's refer to the 14700K specification. The CPU has a total of eight P cores and 12 E cores. While the P cores can boost up to 5.6 GHz, the E cores can only boost up to 4.3 GHz. The P core rules for the maximum allowed frequency can also be applied to the E cores. However, with one major caveat, the E core CPU ratio can only be controlled in groups of four E cores. So for the 14700K, since it has 12 E cores in total, we can configure the maximum allowed core ratio for four groups of three E cores. However, we can still configure the maximum allowed frequency for one active E core up to 12 active E cores. Advanced voltage offset, more commonly known as the VF points, is an extension of the adaptive voltage mode. Essentially, the VF points allow end users to tune very specific parts of the CPU's voltage frequency curve to get better performance. Generally, there are two ways how overclockers use the VF points in their daily overclock. First, you configure a positive voltage offset for the highest VF point, which helps achieve a higher single threaded boost frequency. Second, you configure a negative voltage offset for the lower VF points. That helps achieve lower voltage for the all core boost, which results in a lower temperature in those scenarios and thus additional overclocking headroom. On the 14700K, the VF points are as follows. To overvolt the CPU cores for ensuring stability at 6 GHz, we have to adjust VF points 9, 10, and 11, as these control the voltage for ratios between 56X and 60X. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Set performance core ratio to bi-core usage. Set one core to four core ratio to 60x. 
set 5 core and 6 core ratio to 58x, set 7 core and 8 core ratio to 57x, set efficient core ratio to by core usage, enter the by e core usage submenu, set efficient turbo ratio limit 1 to 46, set efficient turbo ratio cores 1 to 6, set efficient turbo ratio limit 2 to 44, set efficient turbo ratio cores 2 to 12, leave the by e core usage submenu. Enter the VF point offset submenu. Set offset mode sign 9 to 11 to plus. Set VF point 9 to 11 offset to 15 millivolt. Then save and exit the BIOS. We re-ran the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. With the additional bump in operating frequency, we're expecting to see a decent improvement in performance. And that's exactly what we see. We get a maximum performance improvement of plus 17.91% in Geekbench 6 Multi. When running the OCCT CPU AVX2 stability test, the average CPU P core effective clock is 5244 MHz and the average CPU E core clock is 4133 MHz with 1.153 volts. When running the OCCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU P core effective clock is 5,495 MHz, and the average CPU E core clock is 4,228 MHz with 1.202 volts. In the fifth and final overclocking strategy, I pursue an advanced dynamic manual overclock. Now, the idea for this strategy was that I would dig into how to do the voltage optimization with a lot of undervolting and then use overclocking thermal velocity boost to squeeze a little bit more performance at the top end as well. But it didn't really work out as I had intended. Anyway, let me start by explaining how voltage works on Raptor Lake refresh processors and how you can overvolt and undervolt. And then let's have a look at what we can do with all of this information on this specific CPU. On Raptor Lake Refresh, the VCCIA voltage rail drives the voltage for the CPU cores, P core and E core, and the ring. That means a single voltage is used for all these parts of the CPU. How that voltage is configured is straightforward yet complex. Six main elements impact the voltage of this VCCIA voltage rail. We can split these elements into two groups, those that affect the voltage requested by the CPU to the motherboard voltage regulator, and those that impact the voltage delivery from the motherboard voltage regulator to the CPU die. In the coming minutes, I will try to explain to you how each of these elements can impact the voltage of your CPU cores. Let's first have a look at all the different elements that can impact what voltage your CPU requests to the motherboard voltage regulator. An Intel CPU relies on a lot of factory-fused voltage frequency curves to manage its dynamic compute performance. A VF curve essentially describes the relationship between a certain frequency and the voltage that's required to run that frequency. A lot of parts inside your CPU have this factory-fused voltage frequency curve, including the parts that are powered by the VCC-IA voltage rail. In case of the Core i7-14700K, the VCCIA voltage rail is affected by no less than 12 voltage frequency curves. Based on these VF curves, to get a specific voltage provided via the VCCIA voltage rail, the CPU issues an SVID request to the voltage controller. The VID requested is the highest among all the requested voltages according to every VF curve affecting the voltage rail. Here we have an example. Intel offers many ways how end users can adjust that CPU SVID voltage request to the motherboard voltage regulator. But first, let's have a look at the P cores. There are two ways that you can set a voltage for the P cores, override mode and adaptive mode. In override mode, we specify a single static voltage across all the ratios and it's mainly used for extreme overclocking where stability at the highest frequencies is the only consideration. Adaptive mode is the standard mode of operation and it relies on the factory fused voltage frequency curves we discussed before. We can configure override and adaptive modes directly via the CPU power management unit. We can specify a target voltage and a voltage offset for each mode. When we set an adaptive voltage for a core, 
this voltage is mapped against the OC ratio. The OC ratio is the highest ratio configured for the CPU across all settings and cores. When you leave everything at default, the default maximum turbo ratio determines the OC ratio. In the case of the 14700K, that ratio would be 56x. The OC ratio equals the highest configured ratio if you overclock. There are several rules governing what voltage you can set for a specific ratio. The voltage set for a given ratio n must be higher than or equal to the voltage set for ratio n minus 1. Suppose our 14700K runs 56x at 1.43 volt. Setting the adaptive voltage mapped to 56x lower than 1.43 volt is pointless. 56x always runs at 1.43 volt or higher. Usually, BIOSes allows you to configure lower values. However, the CPU's internal mechanisms override your configuration if it doesn't follow the rules. The adaptive voltage configured for any ratio below the maximum default turbo ratio is ignored. Take the same example of the 14700K, specified to run 56x at 1.43 volt. Suppose you try to configure all cores to 52x and set 1.25 volt. In that case, the CPU ignores this because it has its own fact-refused target voltage for all ratios up to 56x and uses this voltage. You can only change the voltage of the OC ratio, which, as I mentioned before, on the 14700K is 56x and up. For ratios between the OC ratio and the next highest fact-refused VF point, the voltage is interpolated between the set adaptive voltage and the fact-refused voltage. Returning to our example of our 14700K specified to run 56x at 1.43 volt, let's say we manually configure the OC ratio to be 60x at 1.5 volt. The target voltages for ratios 59, 58, and 57x is now interpolated between 1.43 volt and 1.5 volt. Modern Intel CPUs have many more tools that allow you to adjust the fact-refused voltage frequency curve. The critical thing to remember about all of these options is that ultimately all these options determine the SVID request from the CPU to the motherboard voltage regulator, which sets the voltage for the VCCIA voltage rail. Specific types of workloads can also affect this SVID request from the CPU to the motherboard voltage regulators. A prime example are the AVX voltage guard bands, which essentially make sure that whatever voltage you request during this AVX workload isn't too low. Since Rocket Lake, end users can make minor adjustments to the AVX guard band by using the AVX guard band scale factor. Unfortunately, I can't comment that much on this tool's effectiveness as I haven't dug too deep into this technology. Note that I'm not talking about the AVX ratio offset tool, which reduces the CPU ratio when AVX instructions are used. Whenever you get into manually overclocking of an Intel CPU, it's always advised to disable the thermal velocity boost voltage optimizations feature, especially if you plan on manually tuning the voltages. Thermal Velocity Boost is an Intel technology that exploits the fact that CPUs need less voltage to run a specific frequency when the operating temperature is lower. The CPU automatically adjusts the voltage according to the operating temperature when this setting is enabled. The difference in operating voltage at 40 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius is about 50 millivolt. Suppose you don't disable the voltage optimizations, in that case, you might find the CPU stable at a given frequency when the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius under heavy load, yet fails when the temperature is 40 degrees Celsius while idling. A critical point of voltage configuration is that we make sure that whatever voltage we request through the CPU to the motherboard voltage regulator is also the voltage that gets fed to the CPU die. But as overclockers and enthusiasts know very well, that's not always the case. And that's because there are a lot of electrical components between the motherboard voltage regulator and the CPU die. Two main elements will affect the voltage delivered to the CPU die, the AC load line and the motherboard voltage regulator configuration. The AC load line is a tool that allows motherboard engineers to bring into the voltage equation the electrical impedance of the motherboard. 
Electrical impedance can significantly impact the effective voltage at the CPU die. We can define the AC load line parameters to account for this difference. Adjusting the AC load line offsets the requested voltage to account for any electrical impedance. A higher AC load line setting will yield a higher effective voltage. For example, suppose we know that a 1.4 volt voltage output by the voltage controller, as requested by the CPU, results in an effective voltage of 1.35 volt at the CPU die due to electrical impedance. In that case, we can configure the AC low line such that the CPU requests 1.45 volt instead, making up for the difference. An option tightly related to the AC low line is the DC load line. But we must first discuss the motherboard voltage regulator configuration to understand its purpose. The motherboard voltage regulator, or MBVR, is a critical component of your motherboard. Simply put, without an MBVR, there is no voltage to the CPU. Nowadays, these MBVRs are very complex microcontrollers, and they have a wide range of options and features to fine-tune. But for the purpose of this guide, we can limit ourselves to two key features, voltage override and the load line. Most voltage regulators allow you to override the requested voltage with a static voltage or an offset. Usually, you find these options hidden in the BIOS. However, some high-end or overclocking-focused motherboards may still expose the options. The VR load line is essential for the V-droop and the voltage under an overshoot. V-droop is the decrease in voltage when the CPU goes from idle to load based on the electrical current. You want your CPU to be stable in all scenarios, so knowing the lowest voltage the CPU runs at is very important. After all, if the voltage is too low, the overclock won't be stable. Undershoot and its counterpart overshoot are brief voltage spikes when the CPU switches from idle to load or from load to idle. These spikes cannot be measured easily and usually require an expensive oscilloscope to detect. I can highly recommend the Elmo Labs article titled VRM Load Line Visualized to see a great picture of undershoot and overshoot in action. While undershoot and overshoot are temporary spikes, an undershoot that's too low can cause instability. Overclockers and enthusiasts use the VR load line to decrease the effective voltage in all core heavy workloads. Note that in the BIOS, we often get a selection of six to eight options for the load line configuration. Still, the voltage regulators offer a much higher degree of configurability, sometimes allowing you to set the load line to the specific milliohm. The presets you find in your motherboard BIOS shouldn't be compared to those of other boards and sometimes not even across different BIOS versions. A final tool we must discuss is the DC load line. The DC load line is important because our CPU's power management unit relies in part on the information of this CPU SVID request to do some power calculations. But if we don't tell the CPU power management unit that we have adjusted some of our load line values, sometimes this SVID information isn't correct. But we can fix that with the DC load line. By adjusting the DC load line to account for the expected difference in voltage between the requested VID and the effective voltage, we ensure the CPU power management unit has the correct information to do its power calculations. Some motherboards, like this Z790 Dark Hero, have auto rules that configure the DC load line for you. At this point of the guide, I was going to show you how to use the Intel AC load line the VRM load line, the VF points, and so on, to undervolt the 14700K that I have in my system. Unfortunately, this 14700K sample doesn't really have that much undervolting headroom, at least not more headroom than what the motherboard auto rules are already squeezing out of the chip. So instead of trying and showing you how I'm failing with undervolting, I figured let's have a closer look at overclocking thermal velocity boost or OCTVB to squeeze more performance out of the chip. With the introduction of the Intel cryo cooling technology in 2020, Intel opened up the TVB or thermal velocity boost configuration to motherboard vendors. The feature is called overclocking thermal velocity boost or OCTVB for short. The easiest way to think about OCTVB is that we're limiting or clipping the CPU ratio based on the temperature. 
In short, once you hit a certain temperature target, you clip the ratio of the CPU by a certain number of ratios. OZTVB is based on the bi-core usage turbo ratio configuration. For each number of active cores, you can define two temperature points, each with a unique number of downbins. A downbin is essentially the number of ratios you want to drop. Let's take the configuration of this OC strategy. When one P-core is active, the base ratio is 62x, so the frequency will be 6.2 GHz. However, when the temperature is 60 degrees Celsius, the ratio is clipped by 1x. That means the maximum ratio is now 61x. When all 8 P-cores are active, the base ratio is 59x, so the frequency will be 5.9 GHz. However, when the temperature is 60 degrees Celsius, the ratio is clipped by 1x. That means the maximum ratio is now 58x. When the temperature hits 80 degrees Celsius, the ratio is clipped once more by 1x, so the resulting maximum ratio is now 57x. Note that we have TJ Max configured at the default of 100 degrees Celsius. So beyond 100 degrees Celsius, the CPU will automatically reduce the frequency to stay within the thermal limit. Testing an OCTVB configuration is notoriously tricky because you can't just set a temperature and tell the CPU run the frequency at that temperature. So most of the performance validation or stability validation of an OCTVB overclock is running through your benchmarks and seeing if anything fails or not. Still, as I've demonstrated in previous Scatterventure guides, we can leverage the Thermal Velocity Boost Voltage Optimizations feature to get a rough idea of how many extra bins we can get with lower temperatures. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the Extreme Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP2. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Set Performance Core Ratio to Bi-Core Usage. Set 1-Core to 4-Core Ratio to 62x. Set 5-Core and 6-Core Ratio to 60x. Set 7 core and 8 core ratio to 59x. Set efficient core ratio to by core usage. Enter the by e core usage submenu. Set efficient turbo ratio limit 1 to 46. Set efficient turbo ratio cores 1 to 6. Set efficient turbo ratio limit 2 to 44. Set efficient turbo ratio cores 2 to 12. Leave the by e core usage submenu. Enter the digi plus VRM submenu. Set CPU load line calibration to level 4. Leave the DigiPlus VRM submenu. Enter the internal CPU power management submenu. Set IA AC load line to 0.3. Leave the internal CPU power management submenu. Enter the thermal velocity boost submenu. Set overclocking TVB to enabled. For 1 core to 8 core active, set temperature 8 to 60. Set a negative ratio offset A to user specify. Set ratio offset to 1. Set temperature B to 80. Set negative ratio offset B to user specify. Set ratio offset to 1. Leave the thermal velocity boost submenu. Enter the VF point offset submenu. Set offset mode sign 9 to 11 to plus. Set VF point 9 and 10 offset to 15 millivolt. Set VF point 11 offset to 35 millivolts, then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. With OCTVB, the main performance improvement can be seen in the lighter workloads that don't push the CPU immediately to TJ Maxx. However, the Raptor Lake refresh cores are pushed to their limit and even with a few P cores active, the temperature will hit near TJ Maxx very quickly. We see a performance improvement across the board and get a maximum performance improvement of plus 18.39% in Geekbench 6 Multi. When running the OCCT CPU AVX2 stability test, the average CPU P core effective clock is 5213 MHz and the average CPU E core clock is 4100 MHz with 1.143 volts. When running the OCCT CPU SSE stability test, the average CPU P core effective clock is 5,479 MHz, and the average CPU E core clock is 4,216 MHz with 1.197 volts. All right, let's wrap this up. The 14700K is probably the most interesting processor of the 14th generation core lineup. And that's because we have a core count upgrade over its direct 
predecessor, the 13700K. The 13700K was pretty popular with enthusiasts, I think, at least judging by the views on my Scatterbencher guides. Anyway, overclocking the 14700K is very similar to overclocking any of the other Core i9 and Core i7 Raptor Lake processors. You want to undervolt to get more performance in um, heavy all-core workloads. You can add a little bit of frequency at the very top, maybe adjust some voltages with the VF points, and then you can leverage all CTVB to squeeze the most amount of frequency out of the chip. But honestly, I didn't really enjoy overclocking this particular 14700K sample because there wasn't really that much undervolting headroom available. We did get 6.2 gigahertz, so I guess that's nice. Anyway, that's it for this video. I still plan to also overclock the 14600K and try cryocooling sometime in the future. So stay tuned if you wanna see me overclock those uh, systems. Apart from that, I wanna thank you for watching. And of course, I wanna thank the Patreon supporters for their continued support. I'll make a blog post of this video as well so you can review the settings and have a look at my uh, stress test screenshots. If you have any questions or comments, drop them in the comment section below and see you next time.